it's just starting, give it a moment. You're live. You're live, start.
Shalom and welcome everyone. I am Ann Sampson, director on the board of Congregation Bina and your host for this series. I first wish to apologize for the delay in starting this evening's uh, presentation, but we, as I mentioned in my in the chat, I had uh, we had some technical difficulties and we needed to iron that out before we could begin. Thank you for your patience. Once again, we are delighted with the great response we have received to this, the fifth event in the Sephardic Mizrahi Jewish Speaker Series. Your continued support is greatly appreciated. Alan Herman of the Canadian Institute for Jewish Research and I agreed several months ago that Congregation Bina and CIJR would jointly launch this series. Thank you very much, Alan, for all that you have done and all that you continue to do in pulling this series together. We are proud and delighted too to have this series supported by the following seven Jewish organizations. Congregation Bina, Canadian Institute for Jewish Research, Kulanu Canada, Bet Raim Synagogue, the Lodza Center Congregation, Jews Against Anti-Semitism Canada, and Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights. Our heartfelt thanks to all our supporting organizations who work so hard on behalf of Israel and the Jewish community, both at home and around the world. Thank you to Ariella Daniels for designing the flyer and to Fleur Sampson and Catherine for looking after the uh, technical aspects of this evening's presentation. There will be a Q&A session following the presentation. Please use only the chat only to submit questions for the speaker. Thanks. This evening's webinar will be about an hour and webinar long be about an hour and is being recorded. The recording will be available on YouTube Live. A few days after the event, the link to the recording will be sent to congreg by Congregation Bina to all those who have registered. If you registered but were unable to attend for any reason, the link will be still sent to you. If you cannot find the link, please check your spam folder for the email. It is now my honor and privilege to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. David Ben Susan. Dr. David Ben Susan of Quebec holds a PhD in electrical engineering from McGill University. He has been a professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at the École de la Technologie Supérieure de l'Université du Québec since 1980. Dr. Ben Susan has served as president of the Communauté Sepharad Unifé du Québec and has been involved in philanthropic and community organizations for many years. He has also served as a member of the Cross-Cultural Roundtable on Security of Canada and of the Selection Advisory Board at Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada. He has published extensively in the telecommunications and energy fields and has filed a large number of patents. He has written a number of literary works, including a Bible commentary entitled the Bible in its Cradle, a book of souvenirs entitled The Son of Mogador, a historical novel entitled King Solomon's Riddle, a historical essay entitled Spain of the Three Religions, Once Upon a Time in Morocco, and an art book entitled A Jewish Wedding in Mogador, written in collaboration with Asher Nafo. His other accomplishments include receiving a fellowship from the Matsume International Foundation in Japan in 1988, the literary prize Chaim Zafrani from the Elie Wiesel Institute in Paris and the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Award. What an impressive accomplishment, list of, list of accomplishments indeed. Uh, it is our pleasure to welcome you, Dr. David Ben Susan, this evening. 
I turn it over to you now. Merci, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure being here with you tonight, although virtually. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to speak on the topic of the Sephardi Mizrahi Experience series. The topic is Spanish and Eastern Jewry in history and today. Next. Next slide, please. We will define the terms Sephardi and Mizrahi, comment on the antiquity of the Sephardi Mizrahi diaspora, evoke the golden age and its decline, talk about modern times and conclude. Next. Originally, the term Sephardi was attributed to the Jews expelled from Spain and Portugal in, 1914, in 1492. The majority of Jews in Portugal came from Spain in 1492 and became Spanish Portuguese Jews, but were subjugated to the inquisitions 40, 40 years later. In 1492, Sephardic Jews were welcomed by the kings of Morocco and Naples, as well as by the Ottoman Sultan. They, set, they settled on the Mediterranean shores and in the Balkans between Greece and Bulgaria. They moved clandestinely to Holland and were permitted to settle in England under Cromwell in the 17th century. Next. However, this definition of Sephardi was enlarged to include all Jews who were influenced by Sephardi culture, including the Jews of the Middle East, as well as the Judeo-Greek community of the Romaniot. Maimonides corresponded with the remote Jews of Yemen, and his work has been studied extensively there. Even in Iran, the liturgy included Sephardic tunes. Moreover, many communities in Europe adopted the Nosach Sfard prayer book. Many definitions of Sfardim have been proposed, mainly after the massive immigration of Jews to Israel. Sephardi meant non-Ashkenazi or non-European, which is wrong. Mizrahi referred to Oriental Jews, that is the Jewish community of the Middle East and often of its Western part of the Mediterranean shore. For the purpose of this talk, Sephardi and Mizrahi refer to Jews in the Mediterranean countries, and Mizrahi refers to Jews in the Middle East. Next. Sephardi constitute a very diverse group of Jews. The photo montage that follows is the work of Max Benchetrit and depicts traditional Sephardic communities. Morocco on the left, Asia, Iraq, Uzbekistan, and so on, on the right, next. In Europe, in Italy, in Spain, England, Portugal, in Bulgaria, in Holland, you had also Sephardic Jews. In America, the first Jews who settled in America and Canada were Sephardim, Spanish Portuguese mostly, next. Also, you have Jews in India, uh, a large part of which came originally from Iraq. And also you have uh, Abu Dhabi tribe in Uganda and Beta Israel in Ethiopia and many more tribes in Africa. Next. Jews of Yemen, we see on the right, are also part of the Sephardic uh, uh, community. And on the left, there is a hidden Sephardic community. And here I'm referring to Jews who were forced to adopt another religion, being Christian, Christianity or Islam, and live a double life. Uh, that means a Jewish at home and Christian or Muslim in, uh, outside. And with the time, they, most of them forgot their Jewishness, but today there is some kind of comeback. Next one. The antiquity of the Sephardic Mizrahi diaspora. Next. The term, Sephar uh, the term uh, Sephardad might be related to Hesperis, which means the Occident in Greek. According to Ibn Ezra, 12th century, the name Spain meant Ishfanim, the island of rabbits. The name Iberia could refer to Ivrim or Hebrews, 
as many Phoenician merchants settled along the Mediterranean and the Atlantic coast, including Spain. Since the time of King Solomon, those ties existed. And Israelites took part of some of the Phoenician expeditions. Next, many civilizations ruled the Orient and invaded the land of Israel and Judea. You have the antique kingdom of Babylonia of Hammurabi. You had the two mega power Hittite power in Egypt, always uh, fighting. Then you have the Assyrian hegemony, followed the Babylonian one, followed by the Persian one, followed by the Greeks of Alexander, followed by the Roman Empire. Then you had Byzantium and Persia fighting for the region. Then you have the Arab invasion with the Crusaders parenthesis. And you have the Ottoman Empire, then you have the Britain rule, uh, the Britain mandate on Palestine, and you had today's the state of Israel. Next one. In 721 BCE, the, Assyri the Assyrians expelled the 10 tribes of Israel, which then settled mainly in Asia. The Assyrian sage can be viewed in gigantic carved stone panels in the British Museum. But there are many legends, legends as well as Talmudic references that include North Africa among the places to which the Jews were expelled. Next. In 586, the kingdom of Judah, which regrouped the last two tribes of Israel, was conquered by the Babylonians, and the exile of Babylonian Jews followed. The Museum of the Bible Lands in Jerusalem has a collection of writing of the year 572 BCE referring to the Jews of Babylon. After King Cyrus of Persia defeated the Babylonians, Jews were allowed to settle in Israel. Next. During the Greek period, thousands of Jews settled in Libya, and in the south of Egypt, in Elephantine, near the Aswan of today. The Roman Empire covered a large part of the known world, but its expansion is in the east was limited due to the incessant wars against the Parthians, the Partumim of Megilla Tester. After the destruction of Second Temple by the Romans in 70, Judeans were sold as slaves and According to Flavius Josephus, 30,000 Jews were sold as slaves in Carthage alone. Carthage is in the Tunisia of today. Following the Jewish revolt of 115 and the harsh Roman repression that followed, Jews fled Libya and settled in the south of Morocco, from, far from the north of Morocco, which has been incorporated into the Roman Empire. That would explain the high concentration of Jews in the south of Morocco. Next. There is uh, an archaeological evidence of the presence of Jews in Morocco. This is found in the form of tombstones in the Roman city of Volubilis, Matruna Batrabi Yehuda on the left, and also uh, in Saleh near Rabat, where you say Mor Morinus uh, Ptolemeus Judeus. It's a Greek inscription, but probably that many Jews spoke Greek, still spoke some Greek at the Roman period. Next one. It is in Babylonia that the main corpus of the Talmud, which is a codification of the Jewish oral law, was compiled. Sura and Pumbedita were very famous Jewish learning centers. Later on, Kerouan in Tunisia, and Fez in Morocco were in contact with the Babylonian academies. Next one. The Roman empires was divided in two. The capital of those empires were Rome in the west and Byzantium in the east. Invasions of Nordic tribes, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, and later on the Vandals weakened the Roman empire. While Eastern Byzantium, Next, the Persian Empire of the Sassanid rules over Iraq. Byzantium and Persia were at war constantly. Weakened by these wars, they demonstrated relatively mild opposition to the Arab invasion. Arab invasion of the Middle East was swift. 
In contrast, in the Maghreb, Arab invasion was opposed 30 years by Berbers led by a Jewish queen, al Kahena. Next. In 711, the Arabs conquered Spain with the help of the Jews. Their advance in Europe was stopped at the Battle of Poitiers in France, although their defeat is to be attributed to the infighting between Berbers and Arabs. Next. This is a painting of the Battle of, of Poitiers. In Spain, Moorish dynasty became independent from the main dynasties ruled successively from Damascus, Baghdad, and Cairo. Next one. The Arab dynasty, mainly the Omeyyads, the Abbasid, the Fatimid, and Mameluk were in the Middle East, while Spain was relatively independent. Next one. Gradually, the Christian kingdoms of Spain united while the Moorish kingdom became divided into smaller kingdoms. The Reconquista was the gradual expansion of Christian Spain until the defeat of Moorish kingdom of Granada in 1492. Next. The Golden Age period. A brilliant civilization would emerge in two centers, Baghdad in Iraq, and Cordoba in Spain. Translation of the Greek authors and scientific interests led to remarkable achievements in arithmetic, geometry, optics, astronomy, astrology, but then together, medicine, physics, metaphysics, and philosophy. Developments in these areas were very significant, and the Jewish contribution to this golden age was most important. Next one. Here are some examples. Abu al Qasim Abu Qasis is considered to be the father of modern surgery. He performed surgeries under inhalant anesthesia and introduced a plaster cast to treat fractures and many surgical in instruments. He pioneered pharmacology by preparation of medicine by sublimation and distillation. Next. Arazi and Ibn Sina were among the most famous physicians in the East. Ibn Sina's canon of medicine was used in Europe until 1650. Arab advances in medicine drastically outnumbered those in Europe. There were more than 70 authors of Arab medical works between the year 800 and the year 1300. By way of comparison, the University of Paris had nine works of medicine at the end of the 14th century. Next. Algebra and arithmetic studies were very advanced. In fact, the word algebra comes from the Arabic word jabber, which means reconciliating the missing part. The mathematical unknown of x, the variable x, derives from shayin, meaning something, as the Spaniards could not write the sound sh. Interest in philosophy was quintessential. Trying to harmonize faith and reason was a focal point of interest among Muslim and Jews alike. The same can be said about spiritual perfection and Sufi mysticism. Next one. Look at some of the title Incoherence of the Philosophers, that means faith should override, overcome the reason, and Incoherence of the Incoherence of the Philosophers, that was the kind of debate that went. I'd like simply to introduce uh, at the bottom of the page Payam Pakuda, Jewish, and Ibn Arabi, who looked for spiritual perfection, uh, leading to almost mysticism, because mysticism and Kabbalah will flourish in Spain in the 13th century. Next one. Three great philosophers, Averroes, Maimonides, and Thomas Aquinas, were strongly criticized during their time. Interestingly enough, their ideology were adopted by each one's monotheistic religion. Averroes said, if the scriptures contradict reason, there is room for interpretation. For Maimonides, reason is essential for acquiring moral values. Later on, Thomas Aquinas said, if we solve the problem of the faith only by the way of authority, we would certainly know the truth, but in an empty head. Next. 
Islamic art, architecture, and calligraphy also excelled. You can see on top left the Mesquite of Cordoba, and the read you see one roof in the palace of uh, Alhambra in Granada. On the top right, you have the uh, Omar Mosque and the Ritz uh, Mosque in Turkey. And in the center, you have uh, an astrolabe from Persia. Next one. Beginning of decline. In the West, Inquisition made life extremely uncomfortable for the Jews who ended up being exiled from Spain in 1492. The discovery of America made Europe much less dependent on the trade through Arab countries, which consisted in cotton, spices, perfumes, and so on. The Renaissance movement opened new horizons to the Western society. In the East, the Caliphate was weakened by the Asian Seljuk invasions and mainly by the Mongols. It is said that the Mongols killed close to 800 residents in Baghdad in the 13th century. Creativity in the Muslim world practically ceased and the illusion of Muslim su supremacy persisted. During this period, this lethargy period, in the Arab countries, the condition of the enemies of the Jews, i.e. vexations and diminished rights, was often applied harshly. Next. The Ottomans kept pressuring the Byzantium Empire until the, capt the capture of the legendary Constantinople in 1453. Next. Next. The Ottoman Empire extended until Algeria and menaced Vienna in 1683. Meanwhile, Iraq was still an important Jewish center, was ruled by the Persians. However, the Ottomans and the Persians fought constantly, and eventually, Iraq fell to the hands of the Ottomans. More, next one. Now we go to modern time. The French Revolution was a landmark for the emancipation of the Jews in Europe. The network of schools established by l'Alliance Israelite Universelle in North Africa and the Middle East transformed the Jewish society in this country. Next. This is a picture of the first Alliance class in Morocco in the city of Tetouan in 1862. Two years later, there was another school in Baghdad. Next one. With the spread of colonialism, the shock of the encounter of Islamic countries with the colonial power was brutal, as Islamic countries still believed they were dominating the science, science, technology, and the military. As you can see on the left, French conquered North Africa, uh, and while uh, the British influence was important in Egypt, also in Arabia, in Iraq, and in uh, the Levant, while Syria and Lebanon was uh, simply under French control. Next one. In the 20th century, Sephardic communities were gradually westernized. Yet, some Jews live in conditions reminiscent of biblical times, for example, in the Atlas and the Kurdistan. Next. as well as in Yemen. Next, many were westernized to the point that they completely adopted the Western culture. For the Jews in Algeria, Jews in Yugoslavia, next one. Synagogue in uh, open air in uh, Beirut, Jews of Syria, okay, next one. Jews of Mogador, Morocco on the left and Baghdad on the right. Next one. One difference uh, between Sephardim and Mizrahim is that although all of them had their own vernacular language, Judeo Arabic, Judeo Spanish, and their variants, Mizrahim continued to use the classical Arabic language in their daily life while Jews in North Africa adopted solely the French or the Spanish language. 
As for the original diaspora, it continued thriving in North Africa, the Balkans, East Mediterranean countries, Holland, and England. It extended with the times to communities which adopted Judeo-Spanish culture and rituals or to those communities which were influenced by it. That is the reason why most of the time, the name Sephardim referred to original Sephardim as well as Mitrachim. As previously mentioned, Westernization of Jews preced preceded the Westernization of Muslims in Arabo-Muslim countries. An important factor was the educational work of the network of schools, l'Alliance Israelite Universelle, which began in the second part of the 19th century. Next one. Zionism and the Jews. Although the Zionist idea of return to Zion was promoted by Don Yosef Nasi in the 16th century and by Rabbi Yehuda Bibas in the first half of the 19th century, emigration on a massive scale only began after 1948. Some felt messianic times were approaching, some feared the persecutions to come in their own countries. Nationalism and the Jews. Some Mizrahi Jews got involved in nationalistic Arab movements. Although Jews of Iraq got citizenship in 1924, these were short-lived as restrictions were imposed in 1934 and 1948. In 1950, emigration from Iraq meant loss of citizenship. As well, Jews of Egypt suffered as they were expelled and their belongings were dispossessed. In North Africa, the Arab nationalism rarely made a place for Jews, and many Jews were concerned that, with the end of the French presence, the difficult times of dreamy condition would return. Next. Many measures were taken against Jews were subject to violence, expulsion, discrimination, dispossession, and difficulties to emigrate. As you can see on this table, the measures taken, taken against Jews varied from one country to another. Unknown to many is the fact that in 1947, the Arab League voted the dispossession of the Jews. Next one. The majority of Sephardim left, left for mostly for Israel, left their native lands that they lived in many thousands of years. You see here a picture of the Farhud pogrom in Iraq in 1941. Next one. Was our Jews uh, from Yemen emigrated? There was the first immigration in 1881. They simply crossed the Arabian desert to come to the Holy Land. Uh, at the bottom, you have Iraqi exodus. Next. Was our Jews of uh, Yemen coming to Israel by plane this time in 1948-49? Next. This is uh, a Jewish store, uh, Sikurel, which was uh, vandalized in, uh, uh, in Egypt, belonged to a Jewish family, and that was a sign of the times. Uh, next. Was our Jews in Libya, where you had pogrom in 1945, as well as in 1967. Next. Jews from the Atlas, living from Israel. Next, and arriving at Haifa. Next, Jews from Algeria uh, went mostly to France. They got French citizenship in the middle of the 19th century, but nevertheless, uh, they had to suffer the uh, Nazi measures uh, as Algeria was occupied at the time, but pro uh, Vichy government, pro Nazi government. Next. Well, there are pictures of some violence which occurred in Libya in 45, in Morocco in 1948. Next. There was also a boat full of clandestine immigrants which sank in the Mediterranean 
at that time in 61. And that's why uh, from that time on, the King of Morocco agreed to let the Jews leave semi-officially. Next. You can imagine uh, that when Nasser was received as a big hero in Morocco, as he has expelled all the Jews, that uh, there was concern amongst the Jews. By the way, I was five meters from Nasser on the picture on the left in 1961. Next. Uh, those are the Jews who left the country. As you can see, uh, more than 800,000 people left the Arab countries, mostly for Israel. Uh, also, the two over Jewish center of Turkey and Iran uh, lost most of their population. And as you can see at the bottom, there were more than 160,000 Jews who died in the Holocaust, Jews from Greece, Yugoslavia, some of Bulgaria, from Libya and Holland. Next. Sephardim Mizrahim in Israel. Sephardim and Mizrahim faced difficult times in Israel as their immigration coincided with the establishment of the state. However, these difficulties did not prevent Jews from emigrating to Israel for the years. The original divide between Ashkenazim and Sephardim in Israel was due to many factors. Firstly, the country was ruled mostly by Jews of Eastern European extraction and their way of operating was not well understood by Sephardim and Mizrahim. Generally, Oriental Jews come from technological less advanced countries, and this was often misconstrued as cultural backwardness. Among other factors, German compensation of the Holocaust was attributed mainly to Ashkenazi Jews, which widened the economic disparity within the Israeli population. There were many expressions of discontent of Sephardim in Israel. There were riots at Wadi Salib in Haifa in 1959. In the early 70s, the Black Panthers movement decried inequalities in the Israeli society. The political party of Daesh and later on of the religious party of Shas aimed to defend the rights of Sephardim. Prime Minister Menachem Begin revalorized the Sephardic patrimony and welcomed Sephardim into his Herut party. A Sephardic revival started to flourish in all the spectra of the arts. Next. You will recognize, surely, some of the names appearing in the next slides. Politicians, presidents, military chiefs, historians, Scientists, linguists, next, rabbis, poets, comedians, cinema producers and actors, but this is too long to include all of them. We have an astronaut, writers are many, both in Israel and abroad, writers and philosophers, as well as singers and composers. A very famous one. Next. A few Nobel Prizes in physics, in peace, in medicine, and literature. Next one. Next. The recent Abraham Accord announces a new thaw in the Middle East as United Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, Sudan and Morocco established diplomatic ties with Israel. Among the many political reasons for the peace accord, these Arab countries aspire to revive the golden age of Cordoba and Baghdad, which was an era of Judeo-Muslim conviviality. Contrary to most Arab countries, Morocco is proud of its Jewish past and welcome Israeli tourists. There are two Jewish museums, one in Casablanca and one in Essaouira, with the third one under construction in Fez. As well, to foster 
positive relation with Sephardic Jews, Spain and Portugal offered a citizenship to Sephardim, and many thousands of Sephardim around the world took advantage of this opportunity. Next. Next. Oh, uh, we, we skip a slide here. Wait a second. So in conclusion, although the evolution of Sephardic Jews was somehow different, there are many commonalities. Number one, the presence of Jews is established in Arab Muslim countries for more than 2,000 years. Two, the golden age of both Cordoba in the West and Baghdad in the East was a time of enlightening, although it was relatively brief in history. The discovery of America uh, left uh, great wealth in Europe and a period of Renaissance started, while the Ottoman rule of the Balkans, the majority of the Arab countries, was very stagnant. Moreover, during the colonial era, Jews were eager to adopt Western culture and technology. Finally, the majority of Sephardim and Mizrahim live in Israel, and a new Renaissance is taking place. A common trait of Sephardim and Mizrahi Jews is their approach to Judaism. Generally, there is no need to divide Jews according to their level of practice, as it happens in the Ashkenazi community, which is segmented into Orthodox, conservative and reform streams. For Sephardim, it is accepted that any level of practice of Judaism is acceptable, and there is no need to shake the Orthodox tradition. In conclusion, Jews constitute a multilingual and multicultural society. Thank you for allowing me to present fascinating facets of the Jewish coat of many colors. Not the credits. Shimon Bar Yochai Su membración, su membración No sea bendición ¿A dónde vais? ¿A dónde vais, Señor Ismar? Que nos vamos, que nos vamos Thank you That was the Berineldo Choir from Montreal It's a repertoire of Ladino Thank you, Professor Ben Susan. That, that was really fascinating. Uh, but before we move any further, we will entertain questions right now and we'll do a QA session. And I'll take a look at what questions we've received. Um, one of them is uh, Where do the Iranian Jews fall into? Like which group? Mizrahi or Sephardi? <laughs> okay. Uh, again, uh, to my opinion, uh, Mizrahi is a new concept, but it's, it's kind of wrong because what we call Mizrahi Jews, if you look at Iraqi Jews, which are mm -hmm. the core of Mizrahi Jews, they integrated beautifully into the Spanish Portuguese community in London and Montreal. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes Mizrahi in Israel is Oriental, that means non Occidental, non Western. Mm -hmm. And Mizrahi Jews per se did not constitute necessarily uh, a very different, you know, the evolution of Sephardim in the West and in the East was very parallel in many segments. In the case of Iran, Iran was, uh, was simply, you know, fighting with the Ottomans all the time about, about Iraq, mm -hmm. but did have an important Jewish community. And there were also very harsh conditions for the Jews there, but nevertheless, I remember I've been in the kibbutz uh, picking apples and uh, we were exchanging, you know, tunes of rituals mm -hmm. and basically the same tunes of the Yom Kippur were sang in Iran as just like in Morocco. So there was an influence altogether. Mm -hmm. So they're not necessarily disconnected from the Sephardic world. They're part of the Sephardic tradition, which is very, very anchored into the Judaism tradition in general. Okay. Um 
Uh, please put your questions into the chat. In the meantime, I'm going to ask you, David. Um, my one grandfather was from Iran. I'm from India, born in Bombay. My one grandfather was from, uh, from Yemen, sorry, from Yemen. He was Yemenite and my grandmother was Baghdadi. She was from Iraq. Okay, what does that make me? <laughs> it makes you a, person, a nice person, what can I say? Uh, <laughs> there's no need. I mean, uh, today, you know, the differentiation, before that time, everybody was Jewish. Once they mm. were in Israel, there was, they, there was like a, a tension between some Ashkenazi and Sfarim. They like, tried to explain the reasons why. Mm -hmm. But in fact, this is kind of history. It's kind of passé because things are evolving uh, very, very uh, positively in terms of integration, both in Israel, in Canada, and, and France, and, and elsewhere. So simply, that means we are simply, you are a product of many civilizations, mm -hmm. which somehow were, you know, we scattered around the world mm -hmm. and try to keep the best of it, of each one. That's all we <laughs> try. <to do. laughs> yes, I know. They both spoke Arabic. Yeah. Both my grandparents spoke to Arabic. The difference, to the difference in North uh -huh. Africa, when I was a child in Morocco, we saw not one letter in Arabic in the streets where Arabic was for the mosque. It's very uh -huh. different from uh -huh. in Baghdad and so on. When you had Jewish writers in Arabic language, uh -huh. it was very rare in the West. Uh -huh. um, and uh, someone says, um, thanks. Firstly, thank you. Can ancestry uh, DNA able modern Jew to connect or locate their origin now? Uh, there are many, many trials of DNA and many companies want to free heritage and so on. But the problem is that to have a good DNA analysis, you need a big, big data uh, number of uh, data. And some companies don't have much data, so therefore the conclusions are not as powerful as the one who have a lot of data. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two... Um, I personally was enticed to do three tests of DNA, mm -hmm. and uh, I got uh, sometimes uh, things very varied from Armenian to Scandinavian to whatnot <laughs> and so on. But uh, one which has a big sample of uh, uh, tries to somehow make sense uh, coming from Western Asia, then going to Greece, uh, Italy, and North Africa which makes sense, and sometimes you suffer friends too. So very, very easy. Now the question is, I, I, I don't think that Jews are necessarily uh, DNA. I mean, uh, Jewish traditions, Jewish values uh, are not biological. We have all the ethnics, all the races, all the languages are present. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I see it. So what can we learn from this DNA? We can maybe learn something about migration of the Jews. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, for instance, the Kurdish population has DNA which is very close to uh, the Jewish uh, DNA of the Kohanim. And by the way, mm -hmm. the DNA of Kohanim, Ashkenazi and Sephardim is 95% the same, although they might have been in Siberia and the other one in the in south of Morocco. So it's, yeah. it's very interesting because the Kohen transmits, you know, the gene is going, right. the name yeah. goes from father to son. So very something, very too, a lot to be learned, but it is, I would say, in the making. Yeah. In the making. Uh, you yeah. know, I, I, I had read the Dr. Tudor Parfit, uh, one of the studies they did on DNA um, was on the Benesra community of India, and they had that particular um, strain that linked them to the Kohanim. And they always believed that they had no cones in their, in their group, okay? Anyway, there's another question here. Um, where is the main origin of the Iranian Jews and how did they get to Iran? Okay, uh, number one, uh, we know that in 586, the Babylonian took most of the population of Judah in exile to Babylon. Mm -hmm. A few years later, the mm -hmm. Persians conquered Babylon, mm -hmm. and therefore you have a lot of Jews also in Persia. Mm -hmm. And it's from Persia that they were allowed to go back. Where do these Jews from Persia come? I believe there must be some of the Judeans which were in Babylon who went to Persia, but it's also possible mm -hmm. that some of the Jews 
of Persia are part of the 10 tribes which had been exiled by the Assyrians. Mm -hmm. And some of the Jews in Persia uh, think they belong to the tribe of Binyamin, among others, and so mm -hmm. on. Okay. But here we're getting close to another, uh, another topic, which is uh, what happened to the lost tribe of Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pashtun in Afghanistan, there's a yeah, let's talk very, about that. very uh, substantial proof that they, mm -hmm. in fact, originating from the kingdom of Israel. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the last question we are going to use uh, What issues did the Sephardic and uh, Baba, the Amazi Baba, uh, Jews of North Africa, confront in developing common religious practices? Well, North Africa is very special mm -hmm. because you have, uh, you know, if you look at the Moroccan language, mm -hmm. it's a mixture of Spanish, Portuguese, Arabic, Hebrew, and Berber, which is called today Amazigh language. Mm -hmm. And you have Judeo-Spanish called Haikatiya, mm -hmm. and you have uh, people who adopted the French as language to different degrees. Mm -hmm. You have Judeo-Arabic with a big, big literary traditions, and you also have Judeo-Berber. I own personally a Haggadah in Judeo-Berber, mm -hmm. which is, uh, the Berber is, is a language that is very, very different. It's not a Semitic language. It's not an Indian language. We don't know where it comes from. There's a few words like the Basque, like the Finongarian language. We cannot associate it with any of the big streams. Nevertheless, the Berbers have been invaded, converted to Islam and so on, but they kept somehow their identity and their autonomy. And there is today some tension among Berbers and Arabs in North Africa. And by the way, if Spain was lost, it's mostly because mm -hmm. of Islam. Oh. It, between the two. Uh, so it's complex. Uh, it's a complex. It's very thing. complex. Yeah, my yeah. grandmother used to write in, a, and it looked partly Arabic script, but partly Hebrew. It was like, yeah. it seemed to be a mixture of the two. Yeah, I don't know well, what yeah. the language was, but. Probably. That's... Probably Judeo Arabic or Judeo Persian or something like that, because mm -hmm. in all those communities there was a special writing which looked like Rashi, but not necessarily the Rashi writing. Correct. And, and uh, many of them, in fact, you know that from Moorish Spain, mm -hmm. we didn't find any works in the Arabic language. The only work we find is Arabic language with Hebrew letters. And okay. that's, that's how we know about all the philosophers of Spain and so on. This has been kept. But, uh, another reason for that is that when the Christians conquered Spain, they yeah. burned anything which looked like Arabic. Like Arabic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, Professor Ben Sisson, when Alan and I came up with the title for this, uh, this series of, of uh, presentations, we wondered about the precise def distinction between Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews and which Jewish communities came under the umbrella of Mizrahi and which ones came under the umbrella of Sephardi. Do they overlap? Um, this evening, you have drawn a clear distinction for us between the two and you beautifully outlined their history, similarities, differences, and so much more. You have drawn an excellent and very clear picture of these two fascinating Jewish communities that have contributed greatly to Jewish history, culture, and religious practice. It is time, I believe, that the study of Sephardic and Mizrahi and Eastern Jewry are included as part of the formal Jewish studies curriculum in Jewish day schools and at the university level in the Jewish studies program too. And I hope they do expand those programs to include studies of these communities. Thank you for taking time from your very busy schedule to share your extensive knowledge with us today on this subject. We truly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Before we close, there are two things I forgot to mention earlier, which I must include the latest organization to join us in this series and to support us in this series is B'nai B'rith Quebec, from Quebec. And we welcome their support. Um, I also want to thank Anil Schoenberg, whom I forgot to thank for helping us 
set up the, the technical aspects of this evening's presentation too. Uh, in spite of all our technical help, we ran into difficulties. You never know with technology, I don't trust it one little bit. Uh, but I would like to inform everyone today that our next webinar in the Sephardi Mizrahi Jewish Speaker Series will be held in October of this year, not next month, okay? We are taking a summer break and we'll be back after the high holidays in the fall. You will receive a flyer at that time and you will get information about the next in the series. Have a safe and healthy summer, everyone. We wish you a very early Shana Tova, and we pray that we will all be able to celebrate the high holidays with those near and dear to us this year. We look forward to seeing you all in October. Thank you once again for supporting this series. Shalom and bye for now.